The title of this message is, How Could You Lose Our Salvation? How could you lose our salvation? You're like, uh uh-oh. What are you talking about, Pastor? Um, I have had the honor and the privilege to go and help tons of pastors and churches and stuff like that. And, and most of the time when I'm speaking, I'm speaking on the, the heart of going out and reaching people and evangelizing and, and loving the lost and, and, and just focused on that. But as uh, Pastor Willie asked me to come speak to, the, to you guys today, uh, I didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say. I had a message uh, planned for Sefri Los Angeles, and um, I told Efren, I told Iron Eagle, hey, it's you. You got to do this tonight or today. Uh, pastor asked me to preach for him. And so he asked, well, what, what do I do? Do I recap from last week or what do I do? I said, do what I'm doing right now. Pray to Jesus. Ask Jesus what he wants to say to the church. And as I did that, um, man, my heart was, was, was leaning towards my, my pastoral heart, my heart for you, my heart to see you flourish and, and enjoy and, and stick to the love that Jesus has for you. And I've seen in the long time that I've been around serving the Lord, I've seen some fired up brand, man, just on fire for Jesus people. Then all of a sudden they're gone. And you're like, what's that smoke right there? Oh, that was so-and-so. He went back out there. That was so-and-so. She's out there again. That's so-and-so, that leader. That's so-and-so, that pastor. And it's devastating. We were with John yesterday, and and I asked Pastor Jacob, I said, Pastor Jacob, would you just say some encouraging words, some wisdom to him as he's about to get this thing going? What would you say to him? And he said, hold things loosely in your hand. He said, one of the hardest things doing this ministry is that you fall in love with the people, and then all of a sudden those people are gone. And it's heartbreaking because you know what they went back into. And that is so true. It's heartbreaking. There's so many times that I've wept over people that I love, that I cherish, that shocked me. And that's the hard ones is when they shock you, when they just bail. They take off because of a girl or finance or circumstances that that offended them just so small, you think, to, to, to you. But it was so big enough for them that they bailed and they took off. And they, they gave it another try. We talk about the merry-go-round. I want to kick that merry-go-round down. I'm done with the merry-go-round. I'm done with the swinging door, the back door of the church. People bailing, people leaving. It's, it's hurtful because we know what's out there. Those that stick around, you see them not walk back like, hey, how's it going? But, you, man. I barely made it, bro. Will you love me? Will you receive me back? Will you let me back in? And we're more like, I'm glad you're home. We love you. Where you been? Man, it's been months. It's been years. Man, I love you. Come back. Celebrate them. Love them. Renew their faith. Renew their strength. We got to do that. So how in the world do we lose our salvation. Let's look at Joe and Mary. Look at Luke chapter 2 with me. We just went through this, the, the time where we celebrate the coming of the Lord. We hear of all the prophetic words of Emmanuel, God is with us, and how he's to arrive, and how he's to be born as, as through a virgin birth, and how he's to arrive and, and, and be born in Bethlehem of all places, And we see all these things happen. We learn all these things. We see all these things. We're seeing all these things, but what about the ones 
They're actually living it and experience it, and that's Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary had an incredible encounter. Mary had the, the supernatural birth of Christ growing in her, moving in her. She was so amazed by this to where she had to find out about what was going on with her auntie, Elizabeth, and found out she too, in her old age, was, was given the opportunity to give birth to John. And as she went into the house of Elizabeth, it says that Elizabeth said that her baby we leaped. The Holy Spirit was in her and leaped because she knew that the Messiah has arrived. The baby even knew it. In the womb, the, the womb, the, this baby being developed was already praising Jesus. Incredible stuff. Mary's wondering and pondering, how could this be? They give birth, and then all of a sudden, these shepherd boys arrive. And they tell her and Joseph, don't be startled. We found you because we were told, as we're just minding our own business, in the, in the dark of the night, just watching the sheep, being, being faithful to our job, and all of a sudden, we had this announcement from Gabriel, the angel, the famous one, saying, unto you, there's a child that's going to be born, and you will find him laying in a manger. Now, as a shepherd, you're thinking, what in the world? Why would you lay a baby in a manger? That's nasty. That's, that doesn't make sense. What kind of news is this? And then all of a sudden, a company of hosts told him, or started praising the Lord, because it's, it's arrived. The, the thing that they've been waiting for is, is, is Jesus to touch down here on earth. And so they're, they're praising, and then all of a sudden it's gone, and they're like, what? Let's go. And they rushed, and they looked around. They didn't have a hard time finding him because it was explained pretty much precisely where you would find him in a manger. And, and that's strange. You wouldn't find that, but they find this manger when they find Jesus, this baby, crying in the manger, and they find Mary and Joseph, and so they come in there and say, hey, we just got this good news that salvation is here, and that he'd be found in a manger, and this is it. There's no other babies in any other mangers, but it happened, and then they walked away, and then Mary sings and is just amazed by this. Then all of a sudden, they present Jesus in the, the temple, and, 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 and Simeon and Anna, they're like, this is what we've been waiting for all our life. Now we can die. We've seen salvation. We've seen Jesus. We're ready to die. We're, we're, we're good. We've hung in there enough to finally see and set our eyes on Jesus to where we're good now to go home. And then they get warned. Joseph's get warned saying there's going to be an a, 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 a army that's going to go killing all the two-year-olds. You need to get out of here. You need to go to Egypt. What? I ain't going to Egypt. Egypt's where we just got delivered. I know the history. They're crazy down there. They, they, they have enslavement. We, we've been set free from Egypt. Why would we go back to Egypt? But the angel told him to go. And so he went. And it saved the baby and Mary from the slaughtering of the babies. That was also prophetic of what would happen. That was already announced in the Old Testament of what would happen. So Mary and Joseph... They've seen all the amazing things. Then all of a sudden, Jesus grows up, and he's 12 years old. The bar mitzvah happens. He's able to go into the temple now because he's a man. And, and, and they go to this temple as they did every year. In verse 41, it says, Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. The Passover was celebrating what happened to them Years ago, their, their grandparents, their, their, it's long ago that, that God set the captives free. And how did he set them free? Through the plagues and so forth, to where finally Pharaoh said, enough is enough. And so when they, they finally got the news, they had to go. They didn't say, well, let me get things in order, let me cook, let me do this, but they, they had to go. And the reason why they, they, they went in a rush is because they finally got the good news that they can go. And it, it, it's another different message for you, but if you hear the good news of Jesus Christ, don't just wait for it. Get on it as you can. 
Don't wait and say, oh, when I'm older, wait, I, I still got things to do, then I'll give my life to Jesus. Because you know that there's, there's, there's when Jesus says to follow me, he, he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't give us any hidden agenda. He tells us like it is. He's a polite and loving God to where he says, hey, if you want to follow me, you got to pick up your cross. If you want to follow me, you got to let the dead bury the dead. You want to follow me, I'm going to send you among wolves. He, he like pretty much tells them the danger of following him. And so they, they didn't have that luxury of waiting because they already were under the, the, tor the torment of Pharaoh and slavery and all that stuff. So when they were given the word that they could be set free, they, they booked. And when they booked, they didn't let the, the, the bread rise up. They had to just take the dough as they could and just go with it. They got all the, the jewels and all the other things that they took with them out of there that they could. They were just loading up, and they just bailed. The Passover was 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 like the his, it was the it was like the Independence Day. It was like the the celebration of the nation that they would always remember how God delivered His people by having the blood that was of the Lamb put on the doorpost for when the angel of death came, it would pass over it, and so they would celebrate that every year. And so they were doing that with Jesus as a young boy. And it says in verse 42, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, Something about those three days. They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. They were at a celebration. It's a religious celebration. It's all about God's deliverance and freedom. And then they, they get ready to go back home. They're in the caravan. They're, they're hanging out with family and friends. And all of a sudden, they get home, and they're like, hey, Jesus. Jesus, come on. It's time to eat. Jesus, come in. The lamps are going down. The lamps are turning off. It's time to come in. I bet they were freaking out when he didn't show up. <laughs> Just picture that. Picture Joe and Mary all of a sudden realizing as they called on Jesus, Jesus ain't showing up. Have you ever called on Jesus and he didn't show up? Like, where are you at? Where are you at? Oh, you ain't here. Oh, well. But we need to be like Joseph and Mary. They called out for Jesus. They looked around for Jesus, and they didn't find Jesus And what they do. They didn't say, oh, well, lost the salvation, salvation of the world. We lost Emmanuel, whatever. They frantically looked around. They looked around their family. They looked around, they, they looked around town, and then they said, you know what? He ain't here. We need to go back where we last saw him where we last, last found him, the last time we seen him. And then they get to the town, and it's a trip because it wasn't just they, they went to town, and then they said, oh, there he is. Come on, Jesus, let's go. Three days. Three days they couldn't find their kid. Three days they couldn't find Jesus. There was a time when Ezekiel just started learning how to walk at the house. And my wife was working a lot, and so I was a stay-at-home dad. And um, I'm doing stuff. I'm on the phone. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And then all of a sudden, I realized, I haven't seen Ezekiel. I don't hear him. Nothing. He's still the same. He still wanders around. You guys see him. He's wandering around. I go to an outreach, and he just does his thing. Take him to the hood. Does his thing. Take him to Skid Row. He, he just... See you later, Dad. Like, no fear. It's crazy. I love it. But I couldn't find him. 
So I'm looking in his room. I'm looking in the bathroom, the kitchen, looking all over the house, looking in the backyard, don't see him, looking in the front yard, don't see him. And I'm like, what in the world am I going to say to my wife? I got concerned about myself, not him anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, where could this kid be? I looked everywhere. It's an hour in, and I'm still looking for him. I'm in the garage. I'm kicking stuff over. I'm looking under beds. I'm everywhere, couch, everything. I'm even digging in the couch. I'm trying to find him. I know some of you guys know how to find stuff. I know some of you guys know the, the urgency of looking for something that you think you need. <laughs> I put that into practice, and I started searching and searching, and I didn't say, you know what, I'm going to take a, a restroom break. I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to make something to eat. All that thing went out the window. I wasn't hungry anymore, nothing. I was determined to find my son. Finally, I walk around the corner of the house, and I hear some movement, and I'm like, oh, I hope that's him, not a raccoon or a possum. He's behind the trash cans that I've looked down that way and didn't see him a couple times. And he's just digging in the dirt behind the trash can, which isn't much, and he's just digging in the dirt. And I just, I couldn't yell at him. I couldn't get mad at him. I couldn't do nothing but embrace him and be excited I found my son. It was just an hour. I, I, I can't imagine if it was three days. There was a time where he started to learn how to ride his bike. And he met some friends down the street. And they're doing construction up at top of our house, near our house. And uh, my wife's like, have you seen Ezekiel? No, I haven't seen Ezekiel. And so we're, Ezekiel, Ezekiel. We start walking. I'm lazy, so I get in the car. I'm driving around. No, couldn't find him. Couldn't find him. My wife's like, she watches too much of those, you know, uh, what are you, uh, those mystery movies, uh, Law and Order movies, or shows, and all those, you know, those things with people getting kidnapped and put in basements and stuff like that. And, and, and I watch those where, you know, construction and a kid falls in and the, the person doesn't see it and then they, they run them over and stuff. All those thoughts are racing. We're going back and forth comparing notes about all the horror that could happen to them. And then all of a sudden he just comes around the, the corner with his friends, but they took a different route, or I don't know, what they went to their house, I don't know. He was inside the, the kid's house, and they brought the bike in or something. We, yeah, brought the bike in. Like, that's what you do in the hood, but we don't live in a hood. And so, like, um, and I, I yelled at him the other day, because I was like, why you got your bike out here in the front yard? You can get it stolen. And I was like, they could steal that one. <laughs> but the panic the panic that Joe and Mary had. I wonder how panicked we get when we don't see Jesus in our, Jesus in our life. How determined are we to put a bike out here in the front yard and get it stolen? And I'm like, they could steal that one. <laughs> but the panic, the panic that Joe and Mary had. I wonder how panicked we get when we don't see Jesus in our life. How determined are we to look for Jesus? We got to have that determination in our hearts and our lives. I'll get there in a moment, but I want you guys to continue to follow along with what happens. Verse 47, well, first of all, Jesus is up there, you know, hanging out with the the, the, the scholars, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rabbis of, uh, of the temple, and the, they don't just say, hey, get out of here, kid. You know, don't, stop touching the bread, the, 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 the uh, David's rod, and all these other things, all the, 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 the things that are in the temple. But instead, they're tripping out on how he's listening and how he's answering and asking them questions. What I found out when I was in New York got lost in New York on our honeymoon, ended up in the Jewish area, and I asked somebody about, uh, what do you think about Jesus, and he got crazy on me. Later on, moved out to this other area, finally ran into an older man, and I uh, said, hey, finally gave me directions to the freeway. He said, hey, I said, hey, why are you guys so, ex like, almost wanted to, like, rip my head off because I asked you about Jesus. Oh, Jesus has caused us problems. 
I was like, what do you mean? He's the most famous Jew of the world. There's so many songs, so many books written. He's the Messiah. He's the, he's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's all, oh, no, that's why. He's not the Messiah. I said, no. I, and then I just went into it and went into it and started asking him questions about, well, how do you know who the Messiah is? You've got to understand it comes from the line of David, correct? Yes, yes. Well, all the, the scattering about of the Jews, you know, that have happened throughout the years, and I don't want to, you know, be rude or, or offensive. You know, I'm, I, I got Jewish background, too, in my life that I found out from my lineage. And I said, but there was also the massacring, massacre of so many Jews in in, in uh, Germany during the Holocaust and stuff like that. And then the temple was destroyed and all these things. So how do you sacrifice? And, and he looked at me and said, Rabbi. I said, no, I'm, I'm just Kirk. I'm a pastor. Just started a church. He said, oh, no, you're a rabbi. And I said, why do you say that? He says, because rabbis ask questions that make you think and go deep. That's what Jesus was doing. He was a rabbi. We find out later on, they say, Rabbi, Rabboni, they tell him, you're a teacher. He even has someone that says, you're a good teacher. And he says, only God is good. Why do you call me good? So they're tripping out by all these questions that he has because I'm sure he's asking it and, and seeing if they understand that the Messiah is right in front of them. Right there with them. Right there with them. 47 says, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. So he didn't just give questions, but he gave answers. If you want answers to your life, if you want to find out your purpose, why you're here, why you're, what you're, you're supposed to be doing, what you're destined to do, talk to Jesus. He'll tell you. He'll, he'll give you the answers. And like, like I was, I was astonished. When I started seeking Jesus and what I was to be, who I was, and all that stuff, first of all, I didn't want what I heard. I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want that, that burden. I didn't want that, 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 that lifestyle. I didn't want all that because I, I saw that as, as a pastor's kid. I was like, no way. I don't want that. But Jesus' answer didn't change because I didn't want it. He still told me what I was to be. And I had to finally be astonished by it and say, wow, really? <laughs> all right, let's go for it. Well, his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. We need to be like Joseph and Mary, anxiously seeking for Jesus, doing whatever it takes to find Jesus. Leave the family, leave the, the land that you're in, and go find Jesus. That's what we challenge people to do here at Set Free. Hey, why don't you leave your family, your addictions, your, your city, your circumstances. Why don't you leave here? We got a place where you can get away, go away, and find Jesus. We, we don't call it the temple of Jerusalem. We call it the ranch. We call it a place where you can go and seek the Lord. You can find the Lord. You can give him those hard questions. You can hear those hard answers that he's going to give you. I don't know about you, but that is so cool that we have that honor, that privilege of having a place that people can go away and find Jesus. Amen? So that's, this whole story right here, just, this is set free right here. That's not just set free. That's Christianity. That's not just Christianity. That's, that's a relationship with Jesus. That's the sonhood, the daughterhood that we have the privilege of is that we can seek him out. And as we seek him out, I don't know about you, but you may have asked Jesus that same question. Why have you treated us like this? Why did I have to go through this? Why did my life have to end up like this? And all these other hard questions that we give Jesus. And I tell people, God can take it. The psalmist wrote some hardcore questions to God. And God, he didn't say, oh, man, don't write that down. Don't pin that. Don't, don't share that with anybody else. Don't let anybody learn those things that you had, you know, problems with me and dealing with me. But pin that in. Let generations learn that we can have those hard times with God and, and, and be in his face and be mad at him and that God can take it. God can take it. He's, he's getting, Jesus is getting confronted, rightly so, right? But check out his, his answer. It's almost, you could see a teenager in, his, in Jesus right here. 49, why were you searching for me? 
Let that be your question tonight or today. Why were you searching for Jesus? Why are you searching for Jesus? Well, you can't search for something unless you've had it. Mary and Joseph, they had Jesus at one time, taking care of them, walking with them, going through a celebration. All of a sudden, they lost Jesus. They lost our salvation. Man, that's a no-no, right? We laugh, but we're going to learn in Hebrews 6, we can do the same. Because it is our salvation for our family, for our friends, for our nation, for our, our world. And we got to hold responsibility as well. He asked, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. I love how raw and real that is. Jesus told them something and they didn't get it. That makes me feel like I'm included. Jesus tells me to do stuff I don't understand. I don't get it. I'm a knucklehead. I, I, it takes a while for me to understand and learn and to be developed in those areas to mature and to finally be obedient. Again, Jesus is going to ask you guys some, some tough questions, some things to do, some things that you're like, wait a minute. This is on you. No, this is on you. Verse 51 says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Crazy. The Messiah, the King, Emmanuel, the salvation of the world, goes back with them and is obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I don't believe that you can lose your salvation. The reason why is because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall get a lease on life, eternal life. Don't, you a woman that one. That's, that, that, that's not the truth. It's not a lease. It's not a, a, a contract that if you keep it, then he keeps it. But it's eternal life. It's not, let, let's see how this goes, and if you do okay, then, you know, we'll let you in the club. We'll let you in the family. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's an everlasting life that he gives. He doesn't give you just, you know, a moment of eternal life. You get, you know, okay, that's cool. But he gives us eternal life. He also says that we are placed now in the family of God. We're grafted in. Now we're not just, you know, we're adopted in. We're not just, you know, uh, hangouts, visiting the house, but now we're a part of the house. He tells us that we now become living temples. We're his temple. Just like Mary and Joseph, they're looking all around for their family to find Jesus, over here to find Jesus, look at the city and find Jesus. But they only found Jesus where? In the temple. If you're looking at other places for Jesus and you're like, oh, I need to go to the ranch, you know, get a re-up, you know, and then, then I'll find Jesus there. Or I need to go to church. Or I need to go to a concert. Or, man, I just need to relive that moment where I first met Jesus. You're looking in all the wrong places because Jesus is right here in the temple. He's right there with you. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said that nothing can snatch you out of his hand. Nothing. A lot of people that are like, oh, you can lose your salvation, they always go to Hebrews 6, so let's go to Hebrews 6. Lord, I pray that you help me teach this. Verse 1. Hebrews 6, verse 1. If you are there, say, got it. Swipe a couple times or turn those pages. I hear them. I don't want to go too fast. I want everybody to get this. You got to get this. I want you to get this. I love you. I want you guys to understand whose you are and how great of a, of a privilege it is to be carriers of the cross, to be 
the, the bearers of salvation and how important it is for others. You got it. Many other need it. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from, from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing and laying of hand on, hand, of, on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will, will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the, of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles and it is worthless and close, close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and the things that accompany salvation Though we are speaking in this way, for God did, God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name, and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so that, as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I was talking about the merry-go-round. I was talking about those that are here and gone tomorrow. And we, we identify thinking they're, they're saved. They're, they, they gave their heart to Christ because they're, they're here. Well, that's works. You, you, you can't get salvation through works. It's only through faith. It's only through the cross. It's only by the work of Jesus Christ. It's not by your works. But now that you're in Christ Jesus, that it speaks to on the latter part, we are going to be diligent. We're going to be faithful. We're going to stay true to God's word. We're going to stay true to his purpose and, and what he wills and wants from our life. And so we're going to be steadfast. We're going to keep on showing up. We're still going to seek his face. We're still going to be praying. We're still going to be evangelizing. We're still going to be loving one another as hard as that gets sometimes. We're going to do all that we can because we've tasted him, but we just didn't taste him. We took him in. There's a difference. You can, hey, that's all right. Don't do that with nachos in my face. I'm not just going to, oh, let me taste this now. This didn't happen by just, I had to take it in. I had to take it in. You got to get in to the word of God. You got to get in Jesus. Get Jesus within you. Get him in. And how do you do that? You have to eat his word. Paul says it's like this. You, you were once on milk, but by now you should be eating meat. Meaning an illustration that it, it, it's the it's, it's same process. You got to get it in. You have to put it in. You have to put it in. And so this is what keeps me, and I hope this keeps you. You got to be understanding that this is all on Jesus, not you. This is his work within you, and then you now have to partner with Jesus. And how do you partner with Jesus? How do you know what Jesus wants? Well, first of all, you have to be a person of prayer. What an honor. What a privilege. What it is to be able to, 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 to talk to Jesus. It's like that time when you're, you see that girl and you're like, man, I want her in my life. Well, how's that happen? Hey, can I get your digits? Can I get your number? You want to hang out? You want to go on a date? And that's, that's, that's just the beginning of that relationship, right? But there comes a time where it's just not talking on the phone, going out and stuff. But you're like, I want you in my life, and I want to have a covenant relationship with you. And I'm asking that we go a little serious. Not a little serious. We go serious all the way. And I think sometimes a lot of us that we see that come to church and they go to a concert or events and stuff like that, they're just dating Jesus. 
They're just checking it out and see what goods he got for them. But there's got to be a time where there's a marriage. There's a covenant. You, you, you read the vows that Jesus requires of you. And, and you live in that. And so in prayer, you get that communication. You have that int- intimacy with God to where you could tell God stuff that you can't even tell your wife or friends or anybody else. But you could just be real with God. And he's okay with it. How great that is that he tells us to boldly enter into the throne room of, of God. And we could just say it like it is. We don't have to wait. We don't need to get an appointment. We don't have to, like, get a ticket and, and hopefully that he's going to see us. But he tells us we can enter in. We neglect that. I know I do. To this day, I still neglect prayer. But we need to be people of prayer. Praying. We have to be people that study the word of God. Man, I, I've read the word of God so much. And... I don't know about you guys, but I read it, and I'm like, okay. I'm just being real. Okay, I read it. I did my, I did my, my, my duty of the day. I read it. Let's go do this. Let's go do this now. I got that out of the way. Man, can I do that? <sighs> Sluggish. Not, no joy, nothing like that. But when I, when I devour the word, as, as, as he tells us in James to look intently into the word of God, Man, we look at his word. I've, I've read this over and over. I've, I've read the Proverbs over and over. I've read the Psalm. I read this and I read that. And all of a sudden, it's, it's speaking to me new. Like, I've never read it before. Like, wow, how is that? Well, we discover how Paul says that it's a living epistle. It's, it's a living word. It's, 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 it's a two-edged sword. It's going to cut down to the marrow of the bone. It's going to get deep in us. And it's going to still cut. And I'm like... I should be beyond the cuts. Why am I still getting cut when I read this word? It's because I still got some stuff to cut out. And how do I find out the things that are cancerous and hurting me? I got to get back in the word of God and let it cut me, let it develop me, let it mature me, let it minister to me to where then it goes beyond just re- praying, it goes beyond just reading the word, but we got to be doers of the word. We got to live it out. It's not just memorization. I thought it was cool memorizing the scriptures because I was able to advance to the next group at the ranch. It took me a lot of time to figure out how to get to the next, just memorize it. My, my brain was mush when I was out there. But it was only to, to get rewarded to the next place where I could show everybody else that, look, look at me, I'm moving on. Don't just do it to have people look at you, but do it for you can then look at others with the eyes of God and you can minister exactly how he did and wants us to. I'm a parent and I don't like telling my son to do something and he doesn't do it. And I'm saying stuff that I'm, I said as a kid, I'd never say. Anybody else do that? I'm never going to be like my parent. I'm never going to say that. I'm never going to do that. And all of a sudden you're doing it. Why? Because you're awakened of how much they loved you, and they were trying to protect you. And so I read the Word of God and all the do's and the don'ts. I realize that that's a love letter. God loves me. He's, he's challenged me. He cares for me, and he wants the best for me. And so I got to get into the Word of God. And then when I do it, then I go, Daddy was right. God was right. Thank you, Jesus, for letting me in on this, this good life that I can live, this abundant life that I can live now. That's what he desires for each and every one of you. So we need to be people of prayer. We need the people that read the word, but we also got to be doers of the word. It's, it's simple, but so complex. It's simple, but hard. But we got to do that. And why is it that we got to do that? For others' salvation. How could you lose our salvation, Joseph and Mary? And we could look at them and say, how could they have done that? Don't they realize that 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 was our salvation? If they messed it up, we would have never been saved. That's how we got to take it too. Man, my kids need Jesus. It's up to me. I got to live it out. I got to be a person of prayer. I got to be a person that reads the word. I got to be a person that's about it and doing it. I have the privilege of, of taking my son on these trips. I have uh, Kyle, he was my other shadow, my road dog, everywhere we went. 
and, and so forth. And so my hope is that one day he just blossoms in Christ and, and sees who he is in Christ. Uh, our older son, Jerry, he sees uh, his mom and me, and we're living for Jesus and stuff like that. And we're just hoping that, you know, they see Jesus and we love them the way that Jesus wants us to love them. Uh, we give them grace like God would give us grace. They see our teachings. That would be straight up about our teachings of saying this is why we do what we do is because of Christ. Not because we're, we're any better, but because we know who is helping us and who has challenged us, and we want to be right with God. It's the salvation of others. We got to do it for others. We got to allow Jesus to go to the party. Just in the beginning of this message, we kind of displayed how we want to say, Jesus, you can't go because it's not where you should be. It's not what you should do. It's not where I want you to see me. But you could try to nail him to the cross, but all you're doing is embarrassing. You're, you're, you're ridiculing salvation. You're, you're hurting the witness for those that really need Jesus. I realized that I can go to parties. It took me a while. But I, I started going back to the, the neighborhood and going into these parties, these, these open mics and these raves and, and these, these events in Pomona where I was at, and, and, and I had the boldness. But check it out. I didn't go by myself. I had friends. I had my friend Derek and Robert and a few other brothers from here that would I'd be like, man, let's, let's go hit the streets. Let's go hit this, this party. Let's go hit this, this rave. Let's go hit a, this, this area where there's people that need Jesus. And so we'd go together because I needed them just like Joseph needed Mary and Mary needed Joseph we need each other we need each other to iron sharpens iron we need each other for accountability we need each other to to, to help each other as we're out there warring so again back to Mary and Joseph they were amazed at what happened and they're amazed that Jesus came with them. After all that happened, he could have been mad too. Like, hey, you're the ones that bailed on me. But Jesus came, but came home with them. Some of you guys have experienced that grace. That mercy that he's given you. That second, that fifth, that 777,000th time of grace and forgiveness. Let it let that be that last one for you, and let's serve Jesus. Let's continue to seek his face. Let's be people of prayer. Let's be people that seek his word. Let's be people that do what he's called us to do, and let's not do it alone. We need fellowship. We need other people included. Announce your struggle to each other. Announce, man, I, I confess I'm going through this sin. I'm going through this temptation. I need you to to pray over me and keep me, you know, uh, accountable. Question me. Say, hey, how'd you do with that at work? How'd you do that? How'd you do it with your marriage? How'd you do with your kids? How'd you do with that? Those feelings you're going through and those emotions you're going through. We need to be raw and real. And, and if you're on the receiving end of someone correcting and rebuking you, don't be, ah, man. But, it, oh, man, thank you. Thank you for... Man, okay, cool. Thanks for figuring that out or seeing that in me. Or at least asking, even if it wasn't the, the case, at least you were worried enough to ask me, hey, are you all right? You going through something? Can I help? Can I pray? Can we, can we do this together? What's your, what's your needs? Man, that's, that's what Jesus wants to see his kids doing. He wants us to see us getting along, loving each other. And I believe as we do that, that's what keeps you going. I'm just sharing what helped me. I don't know if that's going to help you, but I'm just sharing what helped me. I prayed. I read my word. I fellowshiped. And then I did what the word of God said. And by his grace, I'm still going. Do I fall? Yep. Do I struggle? Yep. Do I want to keep going? No. But by God's grace and his love, and the people surrounding me, especially my wife, especially pastors and others that are in my life that are pouring into me, friends and relatives and others that know that I've said yes to Jesus, they keep me going. There's no lone rangers out there. 
that old, you know, saying, you know, um, when you're by yourself, that's when the enemy comes, you know, and he, he comes and he, and he torments and stuff like that. We can't be alone. If you're alone, reach out to somebody. And hopefully we are reaching out to you first. Let, let's just not get so occupied in our problems and then we forget other people's problems. Because here's another secret that I found. When I'm going through stuff, it, it's the worst ever. And then someone else is going through something, and I'm trying to help them. All my stuff that I was worried about, all of a sudden, nothing. Because all of a sudden, I'm caring for this person. I'm trying to help them out to where I look back, and I'm like, I was tripping on that. Crazy stuff. Why would I even so care for others? The other thing is just be patient. I hate that word, right? But as I grew older, I get all frustrated at the moment, but then I see later on it, it God protects and guides. As Pastor Jacob was, was up in Sanger, Seth Freed, near Fresno, he had this property that this man wanted to give, or he told him about the ranch and said, hey, I want, uh, uh, maybe you guys can use this property. So I drove up there, and then we drove way up into this mountain in the Sierras uh, going towards Yosemite. And as we went up there, we had to go through this big valley down on this dirt road to this place. And it had a two-story house right here. It had another house. It had another uh, workshop. And I was looking at it, and I was like, this is great for a ranch. Let's, let's go for it. Let's do this. And I said, all right, well, I'm going to talk to the man. And then all of a sudden, these complications happened with the family. Didn't want him to do it. He was an older man. They felt like they could get money from it. And we didn't have money. And so... They're like, you know, you shouldn't do that. And so we're bummed. We were devastated because they need a ranch up there. And so he was telling me uh, on Friday, he's all, remember that ranch that we looked at? Remember those fires this, this year? Those fires devastated that ranch in seconds. He's all, we could have had men down there burned up. There's only one way in and one way out, and it's about 30 minutes of a drive into this crevice that we're creeping down there. He's all, we would have been bringing people out that we, hey, come to the ranch. It's all about Jesus. He loves you. This is a safe place. You can learn about Jesus. And then all of a sudden, fire just hits, hits him. And so we see now, even though we're disappointed at the moment, that God was protecting us. There's going to be times where you're like, she's the one. This job is it. They're, they're ready for me now. And God's like shutting the door, and you're like, no, no. Then later on, you're like, whoo, praise the Lord. You saved me on that one again. You prevented that fire. You prevented that death. You prevented that situation that would have destroyed me. You saved me on that one again. You prevented that fire. You prevented that death. You prevented that situation that would have destroyed me. So again, keep your eyes on Jesus. He, he's going to say no. <laughs> You're going to have to say, okay, so be it. Your will be done. I'll try again. Keep moving forward. Because our heart was we needed a place to have people get off the streets and get rescued and learn about Jesus. But it wasn't the time. When this place a couple years ago was, was looked at to sell it, um, there was a time of that happening, and Pastor Willie and I were, we went all over looking for another building. Everywhere. We even looked back at 15th Street, tried to figure out if we can get there. We went up to this other uh, lodge up here. We even went to a campground in Oak Glen looking. It's way up there. And we're like, okay, maybe this is it, this is it. And we're all praying. We had you guys praying that we're around here. Some of you guys remember that. We're praying about moving and, and another church coming in and, and, and figuring this out. And door after door, shut, shut, shut. And it, and it kind of complicated where are we doing this because we're trying to make things happen and we feel like it's expensive here and this might be a better thing for somebody else and all that. And, and it shut down. And now look. We're still here. And we needed this place. Thank you, Lord. So those are just examples of being patient 
being okay when God says no. Believe that he's a good father, that he loves you. He has the best intentions for your life. He has purpose. He has destinations for you to go that aren't sometimes where you think you should go. And you just got to be obedient. And another thing you need to do, this helped me, prayer, Bible, doing, fellowship, but obedience to those that are in leadership. Those that are in care for me. Those that have been ordained by God to be in my life at the moment to speak to me and, and, and say some stuff that I didn't want to hear. And that's what happened to me when I was at the ranch. When I, when I confessed that I felt that God was calling me to be a pastor, I told Moses, who was the, the overseer at the time, I said, hey, Moses, I, um, no, it's Joe, Mexican Joe. I said, Joe, man, um, I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a pastor. He said, okay, so let me get this clear. Jesus, here's your, here's my trash. Here's my garbage. Here's my sin. Here it is on you. I'm out. I'm going to live my life now. I didn't like that. I didn't, I didn't like how he put it. So I went back to the, to the gospel ship, and I, I sat in, the, in my, my bunk all night, and I was like, man. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to just throw my trash on Jesus and then just, I'm clean, he's forgiven me, and now I'm going to go try it again. I don't want to do that to him. That's messed up. I wouldn't want anybody to do that to me. And then I finally surrendered. Pastor Rick York was preaching. We used to have Sunday night service, and he was preaching as Pastor Willie uh, and Pastor Marty went up north. And, uh, he said, I'm going to do an altar call that's a little different. Usually it's for people that want to give their hearts to Jesus, but some of you guys in this place, you've been with Jesus for a while, and you just need to say, God, take me to the next level. God, I, I, I want to go further with you, and maybe he's calling you to the missions. Maybe he's calling you to pastor. Maybe he's calling you to evangelize. Maybe he's called you to serve here and, and do this, and maybe there's an idea because set free, we do crazy stuff. We'll try anything. And so maybe you've got to do a skate ministry or you need to do this ministry or a, a socks and boxer ministry. Whatever you got to do. This is your altar call. This is where you can come forward and let the body of Christ know that you're saying, count me in, Lord. Whatever it is, I don't know what it is yet. And as he said that, I looked over at Joe. I was like, dude, you're messed up. Like, why are you telling in our business, man? I, why are you going to tell him on, on me? But I went forward, and I, I told him, man, I feel like God's calling me to the ministry, and I don't know what that looks like because I'm dyslexic. I, I barely graduated. This is my background. This is what I've done. I, don't, I, I just, you know, I, I don't think Jesus made it right, so I just need to talk to someone about it. And he said, well, let's pray and talk. And then all of a sudden, my dad was visiting. He was like, hey, your son said he wants to, you know, go into power. Sure, stop it. Don't, don't call me out. But I was thankful for that because then it pushed me because I knew that God was calling me and I had to go further in that. I needed to go beyond just, you know, taking in and throwing the trash out, but I needed to start to give back what God has, has told me and, and to reach out to other people that may go the same route that I went and prevent them from it. And so I confessed it. And so today, I want to give you guys those opportunities too, but it's not just for those that are in Christ saying, man, I need to go deeper and further with the Lord, and, and, and he's, he's, he's got this vision, he's got this idea in my heart that I haven't seen yet, or I come from a, a group of people that haven't been reached yet, or there, there's this demographic that God's, you know, pressed on my heart, and man, there's kids that need to be, you know, uh, reached and ministered to, and, and, and I see that there's this need there at this church, and, and whatever all those things are, all you're saying, Lord, is count me in, and that's what I'm asking you, is like, man, you know, Pastor Willie will probably see this, Pastor Josh and, and other leaders here, they're going to see you and we're going to try to walk further with you because, look, we were there too. We were there too. Pastor Willie was there at one time, believe it or not. He was just coming into the faith and getting his life and he was just like, man, I want to reach the, the, the youth. I want to reach the college and go down to UC Redlands and I want to reach the motel hell and I want to and all of a sudden, the pastor identified, man, this guy's got a zeal, I want to pour into him, invest in him, and, and I'm thankful for Mark Jappy and others that poured into our pastor, because then he poured into us. He poured into us. Pa pastor Josh, he, he just didn't come here because, oh, you guys need another pastor here? I'm here. 
didn't happen that way. All the other pastors that have come here, they didn't say, hey, I hear you're hiring for a pastor. You guys need another pastor. It doesn't happen that way. It's within the body of Christ. He calls people out. He calls us out. He calls you out. We're all ambassadors for Christ Jesus. We all get to participate in this wonderful opportunity to serve Jesus and care for people. So for those that are in Christ, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to stand up and say, count me in. I don't know what that looks like, but I know I need to go another level. I know I need to be invested. I know I need to be poured in. I, I want to be one of those steadfast ones around here that, that's not on that merry-go-round. And I want to make sure that that merry-go-round burns up and never happens again. And I'm going to do my part in this church. I want to serve this church. I want to love this church. I want to care for those new brothers and those new sisters that are, I want to care for those that have been here a long time and they feel discouraged. I want to care for them. Count me in. I'm not going to just think the pastor is only the one that can minister to them, but I can too because I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. So if that's you today, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, I believe that's special. I believe that's mighty, that you want to stand up for Christ. Just like the, the three Hebrews that said, we will not bow down to the idols of this world, but I'm going to stand only for the truth. And even if the fire comes my way, so be it. If, if I go in the fire, so be it. If, if I do, God's going to be with me, so be it. Whatever your will is. And so as you stand here, whatever those fires are in front of you, be brave. Know that Jesus is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You may try to shake him, but he won't be shooken because he's with you. Those that are in Christ Jesus, you have him now. For those, know that Jesus is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You may try to shake him, but he won't be shooken because he's with you. Those that are in Christ Jesus, you have him now. For those that are without Christ and you're not sure if you die today, you're going to heaven, you can be sure of this, that you are you're a candidate, and you can be, you can, you're a perfect recipient of his salvation. All you have to be to receive his salvation is be a sinner. If you've sinned, if you've fallen short, if you've lied, you cheated, you've done wrong, you've hurt other people, that is sin, and God loves you. And he demonstrated his love. While yet you're still a sinner, he, he died on the cross for your sins, and you can come in to this wonderful salvation that is only found in Jesus Christ. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand up here as we stand behind you. So if that's you today that says, man, I need to be clear that I want to make sure I'm right with Jesus. I've been on that merry-go-round, and I thought I did. I'm not sure. I thought I did. Make your salvation sure by, by, by confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And as you do so, Forget the lies, because the devil's going to whisper, like, oh, you went up there, you gave your heart to Jesus, you believed that he died on the cross, and then look at you. Yeah, you're still going to be going through some stuff, but we're going to stand behind you and with you. So if there's someone today that needs to give their heart to Jesus and be right with him, this is your moment, this is your place. Anybody else? Come on, family. Stand with them. Praise the Lord. Join the angels. They're celebrating. There's a party in heaven. We should be partying just as it is in heaven here on earth. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for these men, these women. Anybody else that says, man, I need you, Lord. I know I'm corrupt. I know I'm wicked. I know I'm evil. I know that I'm separated from you. Will you draw me to you? May you, you give me the faith to believe that you died on the cross, that you can make me right, that you can cleanse me, that you can cast the sins as far as the east as the west, that you can make me a new creation in Christ. You can take this mind that's all warped and tore up, and you can make it the mind of Christ. Please, Lord, have mercy on me, salvation of those that called out saying, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Anybody else? Sinner. Anybody else? Jesus for this moment. For those that are standing right here, I'm going to ask you to say a prayer from your heart. You got to mean it. You need to understand you, you, you are away from God 
And the only way you can be grafted into God is through Jesus Christ, who loves you, and he, 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 he did, uh, he paid the penalty. He, he took the wages of sin upon his life, and he died on a cross. He just didn't die on the cross. He defeated death, and he rose again, just like he said, because he is the true Messiah. He is the prophet. He is the one that says it and does it. And so as he is his risen from the dead, he also said, I'm going to ascend into heaven to prepare a place for you. And look at this. He's going to come back. And he's going to come back for those that are written in the book of life. Those that have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. So for you right now, this is your moment, your day of salvation. And so mean this from your heart. And I'm just going to lead you in a prayer, but it's got to be you. And if you want to say something different, that's fine too. But say it to Jesus. Say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. You know it. I know it. Please forgive me. Thank you for forgiveness. You demonstrated your love for me by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay the penalty of my sin. I believe that he was buried. And on the third day, he defeated death and he rose again. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for defeating my death. I ask you write my name in the book of life. For when I die, I know, I'm sure, I'm confident, nothing can tell me different, that my name is written in the book of life. I need help. So send your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Seal me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to live for you. Give me your gifts. Give me the fruit of the Spirit. I need the help to live for you. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fellowship. I'm going to confess you. I'm not going to be ashamed anymore of who you are, Jesus. I need your help, Lord. Thank you. And for those up there, out there that are standing saying, I want to live for you, I'm not going to lead you in a prayer because you should know already how to pray. And it's a personal time for you. And so I'm going to ask you at this moment for a few seconds just to personalize saying some of the things that you feel, God, I need to hand over to you. I've been holding on to. I, 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 I need this to, to be taken away from my life where I could serve you better. Or, man, I have this vision and this dream, and I don't know how to work that out, but I'm going to trust you that you're going to tell me how. So in this moment, I'm going to ask you guys to pray. join the angels. Holy, holy, holy. You are holy. You call us holy. You call us set apart. You call us out of darkness into light. You call us to call those that are in darkness into the light. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. God, Include us. Count us in. Keep us in. Keep us in this race that you called us to. Help us not to disqualify ourselves. Help us to put off the things that hinder us, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to, to, to be endurers, steadfast, moving forward, dedicated because our eyes are on the prize. And that's you, Jesus. Keep our eyes on you. 
the finisher of our faith. God, we are aware of how great you are and how mighty you are. And we also are aware there's so many other people. And you've included us of all people to understand the love and the value you see us as treasures worth buying the whole field with all the garbage and the corruption that we've had you saw treasure in us and so you bought us you purchased us thank you for that purchase thank you that we are no longer ours but you purchased us and you own us Thank you for owning us. Thank you for, for keeping us. Thank you that nothing can take us out of your will, your hands, your family. Because you are the one working it all out. Help us not to resist anymore. Help us not to disrupt others from it either. Help us not to stumble the, the young ones. Help us not to stumble these brothers and sisters that just came forward and want to love and serve you. So help us, Lord God, to, to seek your face and to love you and to enjoy you and then to serve and to pour into other people. Let us be those broken vessels, those leaky vessels as you pour into us. May it, may it start to pour onto other people. Lord, let us get our eyes off of our selfish needs and onto the needs of those that are broken and really need love and care. Help us to, to be the the answer and the solution to the, all the problems that this world is facing. May we be the ones that spread and, and go viral and, and, and people get to know you because of what just happened here in Yukaipo. At this location, help us to believe that you're going to use us in mighty ways to change this world, the nations, for your glory's sake. Thank you for Pastor Willie. Thank you for his steadfastness, for his example. And just like it says in Hebrews, it starts to talk about Abraham and his, his, his dedication and his faithfulness that have, have stood the test, have, have committed their lives, have gone through some hardships, and they're still standing strong with joy in their heart. And so, Lord, I pray that those right here, they become that to a generation, that they decades from now they can be talked about I came to Christ because they came to Christ that generational curse has been broken because I chose Jesus those things that happen in my family will no longer happen because of Jesus and me going full on things in our city will change because we're standing up for it things in our state will change because we're standing up for it the things that are happening in our nation will change because we're standing up for it. The nations will change because of us being steadfast, unmovable, because our eyes are on you. We're, we're people that read the word and do it. We're not like that, that builder that builds on the sand. We're, we're built on the rock, the rock of Jesus. So we're going to stand, Lord. So help us when those storms come. You always are consistent. Sometimes we're we're flimsy, but we are done. We're tired of being flimsy. We want to be solid on you because there's others that need that. There's others that need to see that. There's others that need to see the value of Jesus. So help us, Lord God, not to take this lightly. Let us not just, man, let's get through this church service. Let's just get through the Bible study. Let's just get done with the prayer. Let's get done with the outreach. Let's get done with serving people. Let us not feel like we have to check out. But help us to be enwrapped. People that aren't ceasing in our prayer life. Seeking God's face like, like you showed us. Do what you see the Father do. So help us to look up. Help us to see you at all times. And let us be about it. The Father's business. Again, you're good. In Jesus Christ, I am. Amen. God bless you guys. Praise God for you guys. Remember this day. Seek his face. It ain't over. It's just begun. God bless you guys.